Welcome to the Money Miss Podcast. I'm Simon Brewer, and along with my co-founder, Will Campion, we created this show in 2020 to explore and unravel some of the mysteries surrounding the investment and business worlds. Episodes are available on audio via most podcast platforms and on video via our YouTube channel. And we're active on all major social media platforms. To stay up to date with every episode, please do sign up to our newsletter at moneymazepodcast.com. And we'd like to thank you for listening. If we could ask one favour, we'd love you to tell a friend or colleague about us. Thank you. Four years ago, on the 30th of October 2020, we had the chance to record a US election special ahead of the vote to determine whether Joe Biden or Donald Trump became president. We'd been introduced to a man who'd studied law at Harvard, worked at Goldman Sachs, built and sold his own private office, was a political fundraiser, yet was persuaded of the merits of joining Donald Trump as his communications director, a position he accepted back in 2017. It lasted 11 days. Yet smiling, resilient, phlegmatic and upbeat, our guest then and today graciously accepted the invitation to appear. He'd already moved on from the very brief Trump affair, founded Skybridge Capital, become a crypto evangelist, and in addition, and possibly inspired by his experience on the Money Mates podcast, has become the co-host of The Rest is Politics US with Katty Kay. That's a lot to achieve in one election cycle and gives us some great material for today's conversation. So from New York, a warm welcome back, Anthony Scaramucci. Well, I mean, first of all, I've never been called phlegmatic before, (laughs) so I have to look this word up. (laughs) This phlegmatic British character, unemotional and stolidly calm disposition. Okay, I don't think anyone's ever called me that before, Simon. So, And I'm going to take it as a compliment. Now, I've had Brits call me a popinjay. Which again, I didn't know what it meant. I had to go look that up as well. But it's great to be on with you. Your podcast is amazing. And you mentioned a four year cycle. You are at the top of the uh, heap when it comes to podcasting. And Money Maze has done terrifically because of you. Congratulations. Thank you so much. And a pop and J, for those of you that are trying to figure out what it means, <laughs> That's it me. means a vain or conceited person, especially one who dresses or behaves extravagantly. So, I haven't been called phlegmatic before, but maybe I'm a phlegmatic popinjay, although I probably think that's an oxymoron, actually. But but thank you for inviting me back. Well, it's, it's really nice to see you. And if I was going to apply one adjective to you, I think it would be resilient. And okay, well, I'll take that one. I think that's a, that's a nice compliment. We're going to come back to that a little bit, but I'm just going to step back because I listened to our 2020 interview and you were really good. And I sat there listening to it only last weekend and I was smiling a lot. But remind our listeners and viewers, because there is a lot of debate, heated debate, both sides of the Atlantic about immigration. How do you reflect on growing up as an American, but with strong and recent family Italian roots? I think this was the real bone of contention with me and Trump. I mean, he started saying that we needed to take people and put them back to the countries they originally came from. I mean, this is a sore spot for our family. They used to say that to my uh, Italian-American grandmother. So what is the country? What does it stand for? What is it? And the country stained with various bad things. It's stained with slavery. It's stained with the attack on the indigenous natives that lived here, where they were basically pushed off their land so that Europeans and eventually Asians could settle here. And so I'm not saying it's a perfect country or anything like that. But one of the things that the country has represented is a hope. Lincoln called it the last best hope for mankind. it's It's a beacon for people to come, integrate, assimilate, and be part of America. And you can come from anywhere in the world and be American. You know, Lee Kuan Yew, the now deceased founder of Singapore, once said America has a insatiable competitive advantage relative to the other parts of the world. Well, why is that? And what he said is that you can come to America five short years later, you're a British American, you're an Italian American, you're a 
German American. It's hard to go to these other countries, hard to go to Japan and become a American Japanese, but it's much easier to be Japanese and come here and be a Japanese American. So the, the whole thing was founded on the principles of immigration. The whole thing was founded on the ideas. And so for a guy to come in now with this nativist rhetoric, and, I, and again, if you don't mind, I'm going to spend 30 seconds on history related to this. We've had nativist rhetoric forever. You know, the Protestants got here. They said the Irish shouldn't be here. The Irish assimilated. The Italians got here. The Irish and the Protestants said they shouldn't be here. They assimilated. The Hispanic immigrants are coming now. And the Irish and Italian and Protestants say they shouldn't be here. And so we, we do it to every group that shows up. But it's a foolhardy thing to do. We, we, we've been such a beneficiary of this mass inflow of immigration. Even these supposed 15 million people that Trump is saying got here illegally, many of them sought legal asylum, I might add. But they add to our GDP. They pay our taxes. They do all different types of work here in the United States. If you do deport them, Trump is calling for a deportation of 15 million people. If he works on deporting 15 million people, he'll lower the GDP by one and a half percent. He'll cripple the economy if he does that. We'll, we'll have work shortages everywhere. The economy, according to a magazine based in the UK called The Economist, says that the US economy is the envy of the world right now. It's growing. Its population is growing. It looks like the Fed is going to stick a a soft landing as it relates to monetary policy. We do have aggressive deficit spending that we have to get under control, but in general, things are doing pretty well. Inflation is better here than it is in other parts of the world. But you know what Mr. Trump is causing, and he's, what he's calling for is very xenophobic. What he's causing is a lot of distress and a lot of tribalism in the country, and it doesn't help the country to do that. But he may win the election. When we spoke on October 30th, 2020, I had $50,000 of bets on. I was betting people in $10,000 increments that Trump was going to lose the election. I, of course, that money went to charity, but only, interestingly enough, I only got paid 30 of the 50. Two people said to me they will not pay me because Donald Trump never conceded the last election, and therefore that election was stolen from him a result of which they didn't technically owe me the money. So that was fine. I mean, that was a it was a cheap way of losing a relationship because I'm like, all right, great. Now, I don't have to talk to you anymore. But the, the <laughs> point I'm making is a lot of nutty people out there. But this election is going to be harder to call. There's lots of things going on in this country. Trump is running on four things. He's running on racism. He's been very clear about that. He's running on anti-immigration. I mean, he's been very, very clear about that. He's running on misogyny. The way he talks about her is despicable, and he's running on cruelty. It's very, very important to him that people are cruel. He likes cruelty. He says ridiculous things. He foments violence. He, that's what he's running on. So those are his four pillars that he's running on. And he still got the tag from The Apprentice, though. I will we'll give him credit. He's been a failed businessman. He's inherited lots of money from his dad. Didn't do too well with it. It would have done way better if he just put it in the SB. But he's a world famous person. He's a hundred percent name saturation in this country. And and the apprentice, Mark Burnett, framed him in a certain way where many, many people in the United States feel that he's a successful guy. So so even though twenty one million jobs were lost on his watch, okay, you say, Well, wait a minute, Anthony, that was related to COVID. Okay, but still, okay, and he, he mishandled a lot of things related to COVID. It actually doesn't matter. He's perceived to be better on the economy than Vice President Harris, and that could be the linchpin of the election. So before we continue this conversation, we're going to take a short break to have a note from our sponsors. Schroders is a $950 billion global investment house focused on asset and wealth management. The breadth of capabilities within their businesses gives Schroders scale and reach to understand and serve clients' complex needs through actively managed investment solutions across the complete spectrum of public and private markets. Remember, capital is at risk when investing. 
You wrote on LinkedIn recently, the last decade has taught me a lot, politically and personally. Key principles have underpinned America's rise over the last 100 years, and many of them are being tested. This election will decide whether we continue to lead on freedom, economic innovation, and multilateralism. I want to just ask you one relatively straightforward question. Are you optimistic or nervous about the constitutional robustness that might be challenged? Well, I mean, it would be impossible not to be nervous because he's talking about breaking constitutional norms. He wants excessive power. He's trying to figure out with his minions how to consolidate that power and make the executive branch, the presidency, more powerful than other branches. He's talking about seeing if he can dislodge the FBI from the Department of Justice, which is in the executive branch. But there's a lot of protocol in there, a lot of separation of powers, if you will. He wants to dislodge that and have it report directly to the president. So that's a form of Gestapoism, if you will. He talks about firing 50,000 federal employees, making them take a MAGA, Make America Great Again, his sort of philosophical principles. He's talking about them having to take a sworn oath to him and replacing career bureaucrats that are, you know, non-ideological, but tend to lean left into these MAGA philosophical stalwarts, he, don't go by me, don't go by me. He's saying this, okay? If if Simon Brewer is saying something I don't like, I want to use the FCC to shut down his podcast. I'm going to shut, the, he says he wants to shut down CBS. He says he wants to exile Joe Scarborough, who's a high profile talk show host on a show called Morning Joe. He says he wants to electrocute Mark Milley. He was asked point blank. He responded as follows about what he wants to do. He says, well, there's an enemy within. Well, who are the enemies? Well, that would be Adam Schiff, Nancy Pelosi. He has an enemies list, Simon. I'm on the list. I just don't understand why I'm so low on the list. He's got 350 people on the list. I'm 48. I feel like I'm doing so much work. I should be at least in the top 10. I'm a little disappointed, but he says he wants to have treason tribunals for those people. He told Maria Bartiromo that he wants to use the American military and the National Guard against his political adversary. So this would include members of the media or anybody that talks badly about him. He wants to deploy the National Guard. They then asked him that question again on Fox News. He said, you know, you were just kidding about that, right? No, I'm not kidding about that. So it's interesting. When you talk to his supporters and you say all this stuff to them, it's, ah, it doesn't mean any of that. So you have this ironic thing going on right now where you have a group of people that are supporting Donald Trump, but they don't want him to fulfill the campaign promises that he's doubting. So there's some irony to all that. So so listen, I, I said in 2019, something's wrong with him. Some of my liberal detractors will say, well, you were late to the party. You should have never supported him in the first place. And I'll say mea culpa to that. I got that wrong. I'm willing to admit that. But I tried to explain the danger of him in 19. Biden won, thankfully. We're back here again. And this is something I need you to think about, and then I will stop talking. We had a situation on the 7th of January where the Republicans were turning on him. They were turning on him. I was getting even Fox News pundits sending texts to me you know, I see what you were saying. You may be right. And then he stayed in there. Kevin McCarthy whiffed on him. Kevin McCarthy's a spineless political jackass. And he had the opportunity to have Trump impeached. And then he could have flipped it over to McConnell and gotten him convicted in the Senate. And there would be no Trump, but we're still dealing with him. So now we have this 78-year-old, semi-deranged, semi-demented human being running for president. And we got people that are supporting him. And we can talk about the reasons why they're supporting him. But we're here now. He could win again. He could reascend to the presidency. The stock market, this is a money podcast, stock market is telling you he's reascending to the presidency. If you, if you look at the way crypto is trading, you look at the way stocks and bonds are trading, the expectation is he's going to be in 12 days time named the president-elect of the United States again. So let me stop you there and just go back to one 
little segment which has been catching my attention. I had read that the U.S. military is wary of him, and then there was a story in The Atlantic yesterday about Trump's supposed hatred of the military. Now, just explain to me, as you've been closer than I have, what is going on that leads somebody to think like that about a revered and essential part of U.S., the fulcrum of the U.S.'s existence? These are great questions. I mean, you know, General Kelly, a 40-year veteran of the U.S. Marine Corps, four-star general, gold star family member, is adamant about Trump saying that Hitler did a lot of good things, is adamant about saying that he thought that Hitler's generals, I guess, were more loyal to Hitler than the American generals. And so, and Kelly also said, if you read the definition of fascism, in my 18-month experience interacting with him as chief of staff, my six months prior working at the Department of Homeland Security, He's a fascist. He acts and thinks like a fascist. And so his campaign's refuting that. But I know that that's true. I know that that's exactly how Trump talks. I know exactly that's Trump's cadence. Anybody close to him knows that. But, you know, you have a choice. You could say, okay, I'm going to keep my mouth shut. I want to be in power alongside of Donald Trump. I don't want to be on Trump's enemies list. I'll keep my mouth shut. Or you can tell the truth about him. Those are the two choices. Kelly's elected two weeks before the election to tell the truth. There's others that have come out. Esper has come out. He has no time for this nonsense. Mattis has come out. He came out in the 2020 campaign. There are 40 people that work for the president in the administration. There are communications directors. There's secretaries of state. There are all sorts of people that have said, hey, cannot work for this guy. Don't want this guy anywhere near the White House again, including, including his vice president. Let's talk about the economy and let's start with tax, because if I read the prospectus correctly, Kamala Harris wants to raise capital gains tax, introduce a tax on unrealized capital gains. You know, the experience around the world, as you know, as somebody who's a markets person, is that almost every country that's imposed the wealth tax has ended up scrapping it. And, you know, the counterproductiveness of tax increases when wealth is so mobile is unhelpful. Just let's talk a little bit about these two economic positions. And, and to start with Harris, because you are a you are a Republican in your blood, if I understand it, but you have, you know, for the reasons that you just sort of, you know, illuminated, you are renting a Democratic vote. Yeah, well, I'm a patriot first. I'm a partisan second. You know, some guy's coming in, he says he wants to wreck the constitutional system of the United States and he wants to seize power. Uh, That's his platform. The other person, I may not agree with every element of their tax policy. So I'll I'll take poor tax policy over maintaining the integrity of the system. So, but talking about our tax policy, listen, we are up against it. We're staring down the barrel of a future debt crisis. It may not happen today or tomorrow. A lot of dollar-based assets around the world and in the United States. So the debt crisis that all the apocalyptic profits write about never comes. It's because the U.S. is the reserve currency. Most or if not all the major assets in the world are denominated in U.S. dollars. And so it's going to be very hard to break that stronghold. But the flip side is if you're running debt to GDP – you want to take it up to 200%, which is where we're heading. Those are Greece-like levels. That would be very, very bad. It could cause a market breach. It could cause a loss of confidence in the way the central bank and the politicians in America are handling the economy and the U.S. dollar. But on this very topic, this is something I implore people, okay? She may not have the right tax policy, but she doesn't want to destroy the American government. So She's never going to tax unrealized gains. That's never happening. That wealth tax you're referring to that's failed in all these other countries, it was proposed five years ago. It got kicked out of the committee. It never even made it anywhere near the Senate floor. It's been in the platform forever. Why do politicians do that? They do that as a tractor beam to the hard left. They're building a coalition. They want the hard left to see it and get excited, and they want the hard left to vote for them, you know? You've got a situation now where this administration has showed demonstrably strong support for Israel. They've got two aircraft carriers in the region. They sent a $20 billion arms deal. They fortified. You have triad, which are these souped up anti-ballistic missile systems. You have triad missile systems 
that are being operated by U.S. military on Israeli soil right now. Okay, so anybody tells me, well, she's anti-Israel or Biden's anti-Israel, you can't say that empirically, okay? But what you can say is their rhetoric is mixed. Okay, you can say that they want a proportional response to Iran. They want a ceasefire with Hamas. You can say that. Well, they're trying to court 250,000 Michigan Arabs, okay? And they've got places like Macomb County, Oakland County, where they need to get those Arabs to come out and vote for them. And they didn't get the endorsement of those Arabs up in that area. And it's tight in Michigan. If she had those Arabs, she'd be well ahead of Donald Trump in Michigan. And so they're trying to have their cake and eat it too. They're doing one thing to help Israel. Their actions are speaking louder than their words. But then they're softening language. You know, the, the real irony of this thing is it's probably not winning over the Arab community in Michigan. And it could be hurting them with suburban Jews in places like Philadelphia and other parts of Pennsylvania. So it's a very dicey thing, actually. So before we continue this conversation, we're going to take a short break to have a note from our sponsors. The Money Means podcast is sponsored by IFM Investors, a global institutional asset manager whose purpose is to invest, protect, and grow the long-term retirement savings of working people. Owned by pension funds, and inspired by their members, they invest in what matters. As a responsible investor, IFM actively engages with their portfolio companies on issues they care about, with the aim of improving net performance whilst minimising risk. They manage investments across infrastructure, debt, listed equities and private equity assets. To learn more, tap the link in the episode description below. So let's just stay with the debt question because it seems to me, and you and I have been in the markets for some time, is that neither candidate, and it's true generally politicians in the West globally, want to deal with the thorny question of how you stop the runaway deficits. Because while whilst you say the, 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 the bad day never comes, we had Paul Tudor Jones talking last week or this week, you know, about the sort of the the inflection point perhaps being sooner. You know, the gold price has been, I think, telling you something for a while beyond Trump about, you know, the destruction of, you know, purchasing power, which is nothing new, but it's just, you know, been accelerating. Um, but these absurdly high deficit by historical standards, except for post-Napoleonic wars or post the Second World War, have become the norm something something will give because the markets in the end take fright or readjust because something just becomes you know it the, it's the bubble in search of a needle so how do you think this debt to gdp gets under control before i answer that something has given okay what gave your pushing so much inflation into the marketplace that you're taking the disposal income away from the poor and from the middle class, their inflation adjusted wages are down over the last 30 years and they're pissed. And so they're teaming up with Donald Trump or they're teaming up with Bernie Sanders or they're teaming up with Nigel Farage and they've got their pitchfork out and their tiki torque and they're coming for the establishment. And they're saying, you guys suck and our wages suck. And we once felt aspirational. We now feel working class desperational. Okay. And that sucks. It's a very terrible feeling. And we're not solving for that. So you want to pay off the debt. You can pay it off in two ways. You can increase taxes and reduce spending and then slowly pay off the debt. Or you can monetize the debt. If you have an 8% inflation, it's like wiping out 8% of the debt. No problem. And so you took the US dollar from $35 an ounce to $2,700 an ounce. You did that in 53 years. Your purchasing power has gone down 98% for the U.S. dollar. My parents, apparently, they bought a house for $16,000 in 1962. According to Zillow, it's worth a million dollars now. So it just gives you a sense for, and by the way, that house hasn't really changed that much. I did some renovating for them, but by and large, it's the same house. My point is that we've corrupted the system. And so, yeah, you'll pay off the debt. You'll inflate it away like every other civilization has done. Or you can do what Bill Clinton did. And I just remind everybody what happened. George Herbert Walker Bush came up with a strategy called pay as you go. And him and Dick Dorman, what did that mean? If you're going to have tax cuts, no problem. You have to find something in the budget to cut 
so you can have tax cuts. You're going to increase social services. Okay, no problem. But then you have to commensurately raise taxes. And so Bush put that in place. He very famously raised taxes because we were in a recession as a result of the Gulf War. He had said in 1988, read my lips, no new taxes. But he raised the taxes because he just passed this pay-as-you-go legislation. He got thrown out of office. Clinton adhered to it. Okay, he pushed through at that time the largest tax increase in U.S. history. Clinton said, if you stay with me, we'll start running budget surpluses. People did. They reelected him in 1996. He printed, which is our last budget surplus, by the way, but he printed a budget surplus in 2000. And so you can fix it. You could say, here are the guardrails on the Congress. Here is the spending pursuant to what our GDP is. And oh, by the way, here tied to that are some tax increases so that we can get our fiscal house in order. Okay, so her plan is closer to that than Trump's plan. Neither one of their plans is great on the deficit. But her plan, you know, Goldman Sachs has said this and others, you put her plan in place, the deficit won't grow as quickly as it will under the Trump plan. So listen, you've got third rail things here. You've got Medicaid and Medicare, and you have the entitlement packages like Social Security. Those are third rail issues. You pull those from people, they won't vote for you. One thing that we can say about these politicians, they're transactionalists, and these politicians are also marketing agents. These campaigns are marketing contests. That's what they are. And so you know, you tell me what you want. I'm going to deliver to you what you want. The American people don't want those entitlement programs cut, but they're getting bled anyway because every dollar they're getting from those entitlement programs is worth less because we are printing more of them and we're knocking down the purchasing power. Yep. And I was giving a talk the other day and, you know, the UK suffered the same erosion of purchasing power, except at a faster rate than the dollar, you know, because we come from after the Second World War, $4 to the pound to the 1.3. But the statistic about what happens if you really run a bad economy versus a good one is that in 1969, a pound bought you 12 Swiss francs, and today it buys you just over one. So we know that is not a path that we want to be having to experience, but we are, which brings me to the dollar, gold, and crypto, because both, I take your point that one's pace of debt creation may be slower than the other, but neither is promising a Clinton-style you know, set of packages that we believe in. You've been, I'm going to call you a crypto evangelist, you may refine that term. Let's just start at a higher level. Skybridge, tell us what you are doing there and what the mission of the business is. Well, I mean, it's still relatively the core mission. So what is our core mission is threefold. We have a fund of funds, and we've dedicated that fund to retail investors. So we have a twenty five dollars or $50,000 minimum. And you can come into our fund and you can get access to some of the greatest hedge funds in the world. In that fund, however, though, we do have some crypto positions. So we do have some crypto hedge funds in that fund. That fund has printed very nice returns. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to talk about them because they're – credit investor. We had a bad year in 2022, but we've had a string of very good years, one in 23. We're having a very good year in 24. I can't get into the specifics of our returns, but let me just say this. If I have a third of it in crypto and Bitcoin went from 17,000 to 69,000, well, you know, my fund's doing well. In 2020, we made a decision to pivot into Bitcoin and things like Solana. I wrote a lot about it. I put a pamphlet together explaining why. A lot of my traditional finance friends thought I was crazy. Some people in the financial journalist community wrote nasty stories about me because we were running a roller coaster in our portfolio due to the volatility associated with Bitcoin. But I believe that asset is here to stay, and I believe that asset is going to go up 10 to 1 over the next 10 years. And I want to be in it and I want my clients to be in it. And so we're here. So it's fund of funds, crypto, about a third of the assets are in crypto. And then the other piece of the business is our thought leadership business. We do something called the SALT Conference. We've done that conference since 2009. So we're about to celebrate our 15th year in that business. And it's been a great business for us. You know, we, we do thought leadership events all over the world. We did one in New York. We've done 10 of them in Las Vegas, one in Tokyo, four of them in Singapore. 
three of them in Abu Dhabi. And those are great cash flow generative businesses for us. Our firm is going to be 20 years old in March of 2025. And it's a nice company. You know, it's, it's a lot of fun to run it. I, I have a lot of very smart young people that are working with me. So I can do the shit that I like to do, which is talk to you, Simon, or <laughs> have a podcast with Caddy Kay or write a book about Bitcoin. So before we continue this conversation, we're going to take a short break to have a note from our sponsors. I'm thrilled to share that the Money Maze podcast is now sponsored by the World Gold Council. Gold has been at the foundation of human civilizations and economic history, from the pharaohs of ancient Egypt to James Bond. Through to its vital role in central bank reserves, gold has come to symbolize trade, culture and currency. Discover the transformational powers of gold by watching Idris Elba's film on an adventure that explores gold's meaning and contribution to societies and economies the world over. Visit journey.gold on your browser to learn more. Before we've just focused again on crypto, I know you know Nick Carey from blockchain.com. I think you've had some conversations. We've had him, you know, as a guest. You know, he's a true believer. I've had gold for 25 years and I scratch my head because, you know, all the things that make one as an old timer suspicious about crypto in terms of its transactional capabilities, in terms of what it ultimately represents, you know, I can't solve that equation. Give me in a sentence why you think it is going to go up so much. Well, I mean, simplistically, supply and demand, but more broadly, people like Larry Fink and people like Abigail Johnson from Fidelity believe this is digital gold. And now they put out position papers on it. I'm, I've written a book about it. And so if you take the premise that this is digital gold and you now have ETFs that are legal in the United States and you have something that I know, what do I know? is that we have a massive selling machine known as Wall Street. So I'm 35 years on Wall Street, Simon. We are good at some things. We're bad at other things. But something that we're amazing at is selling shit, man. We get a group of people together. We get consultants and FAs and we bang the drums and we put out position papers and we call our clients, our institutional clients, our retail clients, our family offices. And we say, hey, how are you? Here's what we're selling. And here's all of our modeling. And here's all this. And BlackRock, Fidelity, Van Eck, Galaxy Invesco, ARK Asset Management, they're all doing that right now. BlackRock has the most successful ETF launch in their history. They launched a Bitcoin ETF in January. I'm talking to you here late October. They've got $26 billion in that. $26 billion. I just want you to think about the magnitude of that. So to me, fixed supply, there's only 21 million Bitcoins, endless demand coming from Wall Street beating its drum, it's going to push the price up. Now you say to me, well, is that the only reason to buy it? I would say, no, this is a hard asset. To really understand Bitcoin, you have to look at the history of money. You'd have to read a book like Neil Ferguson's book, The Ascent of Money. You have to look at the qualities that are in money. What do you and me attribute to money? We use it as a technology to trade goods and services with each other without bartering. So it is literally a database. Your bank is a database. Yes, it's other things, but it really is a database. Your money's over here. My money's over there. We want to buy a Mercedes. We wire our money out of our accounts, send it to the Mercedes account. Our accounts go down. Their account goes up. They send you the vehicle. These are digits in a bank account. Well, what is, what is Bitcoin? It is a fully distributed, very transparent, verified by an army of 190 to now 200,000 nodes you send money to me. I received the money. 180,000 people verify the transaction and sanctify it. We no longer need a third party corresponding bank to do this transaction. And it is incredible technology. So a result of which, is it gold? Is it a digital asset class? Larry Fink says it is. It's trading at $1.3 trillion now. If he is correct, 
it should trade closer to gold. Gold's at a $17 trillion market gap. Let's say Bitcoin can get to half of gold. You know, then it's at eight, nine, ten trillion dollars. It's 10x from where it is today. I think that happens in 10 years. I don't think that that's a outlandish statement to make, but supply demand is really driving it. Okay, you make the case. Nick Carey actually had a question, which was which administration do you think will be better for the tech industry and crypto? I have a contrarian view to this. The consensus view is Donald Trump is better for crypto. Kamala Harris is bad for crypto. That's the consensus view. But I have a contrarian view to this. I don't think it matters. I think Donald Trump would be good for crypto. I'm not saying he wouldn't be. But I think the age of Gary Gensler and Elizabeth Warren is over. I think that the Democrats realize they have to have a positive crypto regulatory rubric. And I think the days of being anti-crypto are behind us. And by the way, the reason we became so anti-crypto had to do with Sam Bankman-Fried at FTX. And I'll explain this briefly. His parents were close to Elizabeth Warren. Elizabeth Warren's lackey is Gary Gensler. They had countless meetings with Gensler and Warren about their son and FTX and FTX getting margin approval. When he blew up and that fraud was exposed, those two people lurched very hard to the anti-crypto stance to eclipse the activity that they had with the Bankman Freeds. And it's really that expedient. There's nothing else to it. All of the nonsense about it being money laundering, all of that stuff is all made up nonsense because the number one instrument for money laundering is the US dollar. It's actually pretty easy to trace nefarious activity over the blockchain because the things are easy to see where they're transferred to each other. So Trump would be better in the short term because he would put some things in place almost immediately that would provide some regulatory relief. But I think that both these people are going to come up with a bipartisan legislative package that includes a stablecoin legislation that includes clarity on what a token is and what a commodity is and what a security is in the space. And so I'm very bullish on both on the specific topic of crypto. You know, if you ask me about broader things, I can provide that. But I, I don't think these guys are going to hurt crypto in 25 and 26, either side. Let's just come back to that earlier comment I made on resilience being one of your paramount skills, because you, as I understand it, were invested with the SPF setup. We had Michael Lewis on, who's now been on twice, who I know all the way back from days at the LSE, and he'd obviously been there and written this book, terrific book. How did you deal with what was, I guess, a pretty hairy experience? Well, I mean, listen, that, I mean, I've had some painful things happen to me. That was probably, from a business point of view, the most painful because I liked Sam. I trusted Sam. I got on with Sam's dad, specifically, Joe Bankman, the former professor from Stanford. I thought that this was a very credible, very classy, high-end family. And it blew my mind that Sam was willing to, from an ethics point of view, commit that high of a level of a fraud. I, I, I mean, it was not comprehensible to me. He was doing so well. Could he have been worth a billion dollars and not committed a fraud? Sure. To commit the fraud, you're going to be worth $20 billion. How is that even worth it? As you know, because you're a financier, you get caught. It's just not worth it. Okay. Things in our business are very transparent and you eventually get caught. It's just the way it works. Okay. So I was devastated. Now, what's interesting, you bring up Michael Saylor. So Michael came to an event that Sam and I hosted. We did something called Crypto Bahamas. We had a big conference in April of 2022. We brought all types of luminaries. Tony Blair was there. Bill Clinton was there. Lots of celebrities. Katy Perry was there with Orlando Bloom, et cetera, Giselle and Tom Brady. And maybe that was a sign of a top, actually, that <laughs> we brought. All, yes, maybe, maybe. maybe that was. But, but Michael Lewis was there. And Michael Lewis said that he loved Sam. He was so enthralled with this whole effective or virtual cap, you know, altruism and all the stuff, stuff he was doing. And he was enthralled with Sam, which made me further enthralled with Sam. 
And Michael said to me that if he thought Sam was a fraud, when the fraud got exposed and I called Michael, he said, well, you know, if, if this guy's really committed fraud, I'm not going to write the book. And so you read the book and found it fascinating. I read the book as an insider. And, you know, it almost seemed like an apology on behalf of Sam. And it's never been clear to me what Michael really thinks about the subject. Does he really think that Sam did nothing wrong and he's going to be exonerated on this appeal that he's doing? Or did he do something wrong, but Michael got too close to it? I don't know. But I told the truth. I had to submit myself to four and a half hours of testimony. Department of Justice, IRS, SEC, and the FBI. And there was a phalanx of 15 people in a room, me and my attorney on the other side. I turned over all my books and records. I turned over all my WhatsApps, my signals. I turned over my text messages. I turned over my emails. And I sat there for four and a half hours and told them about my experience. So what I would tell people about resilience, integrity matters. Okay, if you have integrity you will always have opportunity. So did I make a mistake in allowing Sam to buy into my business? Yes. Should I have seen the red flags? Perhaps, but Simon, 25 venture capitalists, sovereign wealth funds, private investors, Larry Fink, Black, they they lost $25 million investing in Sam's business. So, you know, maybe, but he did fool people that are smarter than me. And so, I got caught in a lie, but it wasn't my lie. I got defrauded like everybody else. And what I tell people, you want to be resilient, have integrity. I went to the Department of Justice. They asked me if I wanted a proffer. I don't know if the Brits know what that means, but it means I'm going to testify now as a witness in this case. And so do I want a proffer, meaning do I want certain segments of my testimony cannot be admissible into evidence if they come and prosecute me. They asked me if I wanted that, that I want to slice out aspects of the transcript so they couldn't use it because it would be like self-incrimination, right? I said, no, I don't want to proffer. I'm going to tell you what happened. I didn't do anything wrong. You've got all my books and records and my text messages and my emails. So I survived it. I survived it because the Department of Justice really didn't do anything wrong. I didn't do anything wrong. We're negotiating now with the bankruptcy estate. They're threatening to sue Skybridge because they say that they want to try to claw back the money. We don't think they have a clawback right. We want to negotiate with them the repurchase of our shares, but they also did damage our firm and damage my reputation. So we'll either be in a lawsuit with these guys in the next couple of weeks or we'll have a negotiated settlement, one or the other. But Simon, here's the beauty of taking a lot of BS in the press, okay? Once your cherry has been popped in the press and you've been lit up and destroyed in the press, you don't care. Say whatever the hell you want. I don't care. And that's also resilience, right? As long as you can put your mind space at ease that whatever people are saying about you or for a minute thinking about you, it doesn't make any difference to you. It's a lot easier. It's a lot easier. Just going back to the question you posed, which is you weren't sure what Michael Lewis actually thought. I'm going to send you the interview we did with him because I actually think that he, you get more of a color on that in that conversation. Anyway, I'll send that to you afterwards. And it's a very good explanation about resilience because, you know, we all get hit one way or another in the investing business and any other business. And it's, it's how we get up from the canvas. I'm with you, brother. And I think Michael's a brilliant guy and I have an enormous amount of respect for him. And I would love to hear that interview. And I read the book. I did see a tinge of an apologia in the book. It was almost like a letter to the judge on Sam's behalf. You know, when you write an amicus letter, try to get somebody's sentence reduced. That was Michael's book in my mind. So the great quotation, which is useful for anybody who's dealing with this, I think was from J.K. Rowling of Harry Potter, who said, rock bottom was the place from which I rebuilt my life. So there you go. I've got some more general questions as we move. Yeah, well said. But, you know, let me just finish this. When you're at rock bottom, do you give a shit? And I think in J.K. Rowling's situation, based on my observation of her, she didn't. And anytime I've hit bottom in my life, I haven't. And I think if you do, 
if you do give a shit, then it's very hard to come back from it because you're plagued with levels of self-consciousness that you can't survive. So one question, because we have a lot of young folks who listen to the show, we sponsor universities, finance societies, and in fact, one young man called Ben Campion, who's in New Zealand on his gap year and is the son of my co-founder, Will Campion, was really excited. He's a big fan of your show. And he said, when young folks are thinking about the financial services industry as a career, what advice would you offer? Well, I love this industry. So, you know, I mean, some people say going to tech or going to VC or going to AI, When I was a kid, this was the hot dot industry. But I think if you come into this industry with the right expectations, this is an incredible industry. And so I guess what I would say to somebody, three things. Number one, it's not a get rich quick industry. It's a get rich slow industry. Don't chase the hot dot or the hot buck. You'll do quite well. Number two, This industry is the business of understanding other businesses. So if you're an investment banker, well, you got to understand different sectors that you're banking in. If you're in the world of a stock brokering, you have to understand the companies or at least have some idea what the companies are doing and what the fundamentals are of the income statement and balance sheet before you make an investment decision. If you're in asset management, you've got that skill set going on. Plus, you have a sales and marketing hat that you have to wear. And so for me, this has been the most fascinating business because it's the business of understanding other businesses. And so if you're an incredibly intellectually curious person, come into finance, but stay in finance. I don't think you're going to serve yourself well if you come into finance with a one or two year goal. You're not going to get it. It took me 15 years in finance to really understand, and by the way, I don't understand it today, but let me rephrase it. It took me 15 years in finance to have a better handle on what was going on and to have a recalibration of my personal game plan. Okay, so that was age 40. I'm now age 60. And having that understanding has been enlightening. That's been very helpful to me. You know, And and I would say to anybody coming into this space, Be here for the long term. If you're intellectually curious, learn about as many companies, many industries as possible, and then have a plan, have a discipline. My discipline, which wasn't this until my age of 40, is very simple. Here's the money coming in. Some of that money's going to the market every month, no matter what. And I'm not even going to look at it. And there's a reason, Simon, that the dead people do better than the living people, okay? Do you know that dead people don't look at their accounts, Simon? Did you know that? They don't look at their accounts. So when when they're sitting at Charles Schwab or they're sitting at Fidelity, they don't get swayed by their emotions or the impulses of what's going on moment to moment in the market. I, I have a great story for you. It's a very quick one. I misplaced an account. My son was born in September of 1992. I made a $1,200 investment in Microsoft. I ticked the box for dividend reinvestment. There were no dividends being paid at that time, but if they ever paid one, they would reinvest it in the shares of Microsoft on my behalf. Actually, my son's behalf. This is when there was paper accounts, you know, paper statement got mailed to the house. I moved a couple of times. It didn't catch up to me. The account statement got lost in the mail. 26 years went by. Somebody from Goldman Sachs recognized my name. They called me. They said, okay, your social security number, yes, baba. Okay, great. This is your account. It's a uniform gift for minors account for your son. Your son's above the age of 21. Would you like us to disperse this to him or transfer this account out to him? Yes, I would. What do you think the $1,200 of Microsoft went to? I got 200,000 bucks. I wish it was that high, but it was clear. It was 72,000. So we went from 1200 to 72000 and I would have sold that years ago, Simon. You know, when Steve Ballmer was running Microsoft, yep. and he's a very smart guy himself because he stayed in his position. He's worth more than Bill Gates now. But if Steve Ballmer was running Microsoft, it was flatlining. I would have gotten bored with Microsoft and sold it. I didn't do that. And my son was a direct beneficiary of me not knowing that the account existed. Yeah. I think it's a big lesson for people. Don't do a lot of trading, stay long-term, 
act like you're dead. Okay, well, it's a lesson that I seem to fail weekly, monthly, yearly, but you're right. Now, but stepping back from the noise, what worries you most about markets today? The big worry for me about markets is a breach in the Western liberal democracies. And so the democracies are under stress. We just talked about what's going on with disposable income for lower and middle income people. We probably outsourced too many jobs. We've created a job crisis. There's a migrant crisis happening, which makes these people fear the migrants and makes them fear that their jobs are going to be taken away. We're monetizing our debt with decent levels of inflation. And result of which, this could cause a political crisis in the West. If we get strong populist leaders, okay, that go away from democratic systems, it's going to be very, very bad for the stock market. It's going to be very, very bad for deep, liquid capital markets. And your country and my country have distilled at least a thousand years of political wisdom, possibly 2,000, you know. Democracy started in Greece. It got refined into a republic before it failed in Rome. You guys created a parliamentarian system. King John, to me, is actually one of the great intellectual heroes of all time because he understood through the Magna Carta that he had to have some, he had to delegate some of his power. He had to decentralize some of the power. Otherwise, he was going to get toppled. And whether we like it or not, Churchill is right. Democracy sucks as a form of government. It's the worst form of government until you compare it to every other form of government. And his point is, there's a reason why your system has flourished and an empire was created. It's still a very good system. And the reason why the United States is arguably one of the most prosperous, if not the most prosperous country in the world, is that these are decentralized, flat political systems where people feel that they can achieve and reach their aspirations and there's levels of predictability in the loss. Donald Trump is saying that he wants to end the independence of the Fed. God help us if that happens. Now, a lot of people say, well, Donald Trump only says that. He doesn't really mean it. Okay, well, this is an interesting political candidate now because he's saying a lot of things and his voters are going to vote for him with the implication that he doesn't mean and is not going to fulfill the promises he talks about. It. He says, well, I'm going to come after my political adversaries with the National Guard or the U.S. military. OK, well, do you mean that, sir? Yes, I mean it. OK, but his people don't think he's going to mean it. But if he takes away Fed independence, if he works a machination, we know that that has never worked when the political leader is tied to the interest rate discovery and the interest rate setting of the central bank. Just look at Erdogan and what he did to Turkey as the most recent example. So to me, it's the political risk that our system gets threatened because there's a good 25% of the people that have disaffected from the system. They don't think the system's working for them anymore. They don't think the system is fair to them. Got it. Uh, two final questions. Your podcast, The Rest is Politics US with Caddy K, I've listened to. I think you two do a really good job. So well done. What does the podcasting world give you you didn't have before? Well, first of all, she's brilliant. So it's a lot of fun to talk to her. And so, you know, I'm quite inquisitive on the show. I want to hear what she has to say. She's very well sourced and she's a very popular journalist. But I think what it's given me is a pretty big microphone, pretty big platform. And it's also helped me with sourcing. So it's a political podcast, but I will get a feed from my friends at the Trump campaign. I'm no longer a Trump supporter, but I have a lot of friends that work for him. So I get a feed from them. On the flip side, I get a feed from the Harris campaign. And it's sort of a weird thing when you have a podcast that's dropping hundreds of thousands of downloads, as you know, because you have a super successful podcast in the money maze. Now you get a lot more pickup on sourcing. I'm sure as a result of the success of your podcast, you're meeting and talking to people that you probably didn't envision yourself talking to before you originated the podcast. 
I think that that's happening to us. Absolutely. I'd say, I say unequivocally, this is the most enjoyable thing I've done in my working life. So that leads us, of course, Anthony, to the last question. I think you've you answered it. very formally, though. You're a typical Brit. I mean, <laughs> I'm showing up with my Team USA Minion t-shirt. You're sitting there in, like, uh, Brioni. Well, I, that's because so I've seen you in your tie lots of times, and I thought, you know, I thought I better be prepared, but yeah, that's no, okay. I always, but I always dress with a t-shirt for these podcasts, <laughs> even to the alarm of Caddy K. She's like looking at me, what the hell are you doing in a t-shirt? I, I don't know. It's a podcast. Okay. Well, that's a video podcast. So you see, there you go. So now the question, Anthony, which you probably have answered is who wins the election? Well, it is the toughest question. And four years ago, you asked me that question and bang, I said it was Joe Biden instantaneously. And I, as I said, I bet lots of money on it. This year, it's harder to predict. There's a tightening of the polls. Some people are saying it's being overcorrected for Trump under polling. So he under polled in 2016. The pollsters got it wrong. He under polled in 2020. The pollsters got it wrong. It was a very narrow victory by Biden, by the way, even though he won eight and a half million of the popular vote, he only won by 40,000 votes. And so now the question is, is he under polled or not? I don't think he's under polled at this point. I actually think the likelihood that Dobbs is under polled. And just for your listeners outside of the United States, what is Dobbs? That's the Supreme Court case that overturned Roe versus Wade, which was the national pro-choice movement. You could get an abortion. You were legally entitled to one in any state, all 50 states. Dobbs overturned that. 14 of the 50 states have said that they will not allow for abortion in their states anymore. They, they've imposed an abortion ban. And the Democrats have been under polled in 22 and in 23 by five or 6%. So with that, I believe that Kamala Harris is going to win the election. I think she's going to shock people. Now, if you brought a Trump guy on right now, he would be laughing in my face. He'd be telling me there's a big landslide if you follow Twitter because it's slanted towards Trump because of Elon's support of Donald Trump and his financial and political contributions. You would think that he's winning in a 49 state landslide. But I would say this the smugness from the Trump campaign is reminiscent of the 2012 Romney campaign. And of course, they thought they were going to be very successful, but Mitt unfortunately didn't ascend to the presidency. And I, I was there to support him. So, so I'm going with Harris. I like her cards relative to Trump. She's got the organization, she's got the marketing muscle with a billion and a half dollars raised. And, you know, he's running on a platform that I think is despicable. He's talking about non-white immigrants to the United States the way the National Socialists talked about the Jews. And so for that reason and many others, I think people are going to grow tired of it and not vote for him at the voting booth. But if I'm wrong, I'm an American. I'll live with the consequences. It's like a good British football game or English football game. Shake hands and move on. <laughs> but, you know, if he does the stuff that he's talking about, I'll be living in your basement, Simon, because I'm on his enemies list and I'll be I'll be living in your basement somewhere in the UK. For a modest fee, not, not paid because I don't have a crypto account to receive it in Bitcoin. However, Anthony, hopefully it won't be four years. We've had an invitation out for you for four years, which is for we'll host a dinner for you when you come to London. And that would be great fun for us. Uh, that would be great. I look forward to it. I'm, get, I'm getting over there a lot now because of these podcasts. And so I would look forward to that. And I'm obviously a big fan of your country. And I've spent a lot of time there over the years. Went to the London School of Economics for a semester, although LSE at that time stood for Let's See Europe. So try not to laugh about that, but that's what we said as Americans. And we always summarize, but in fact, the thing that you said that I think resonates to anybody, whatever their vocation or where they are in life, is that when you talked about resilience, you said it's much easier to deal with the bad stuff if you have integrity. And, you know, integrity is such an important word. So thank you for bringing that up. Anthony, thank you for being here today. Good luck. And we look forward to seeing you. Good to see you, Simon. Thank you. All content on the Money Maze podcast is for your general information and use only and is not intended to address your particular requirements. In particular, the content does not constitute any form of advice, recommendation, representation, endorsement or arrangement and is not intended to be relied upon by users in making or refraining from making any specific investment or other decisions. 
We try to provide content that is true and accurate as of the date of publishing. However, we give no assurance or warranty regarding the accuracy, timeliness, or applicability of any of the content. Guests, presenters, and other individuals involved in the production of this podcast may have positions in any of the investments discussed.